All right, I think we're going to get started at 6 o'clock. Um, first of all, good evening and thank you all for coming tonight. I'm really happy with this turnout. Um, before we get started, I just want to welcome you to the York Emergency Operations Center, for those of you who have been here. It's just sort of a feather in the cap of the town. Um, I want to just point out the two exits, the one you came in, and then the one over here in case of an emergency. Um, we're going to ask, oh, and the restrooms are just beyond those doors right there. If you need to feel free. Um, we're going to ask that people time their cell phones to silence. And we're also going to ask hold questions until the end, if we could. On the back table back there, there's some scrap paper and some pens if you want to write down some questions to ask at the end. So my name is Kim Stewart, and I'm the Animal Control Officer. I've been with the Animal Control Officer for the Town of Situa for 24 years. Um, I can say with a great deal of confidence that the biggest or the most calls I get are involving wildlife, and more specifically, coyotes. So that's why we um, put this presentation together for you tonight. Um, I'm joined up here by Dave Morocco and Sergeant Andrew Ford from Mass Environment Police, and Jason Zimmer, who is the District Supervisor for the Mass Department of Fisheries and Wildlife. All of these gentlemen are very experienced in wildlife behavior and are very familiar with Situate and some of the coyote populations that have been reported over the years. So I want to thank each of them for taking time out to come here today and to share their knowledge, um, dispel some of the myths, give you the facts, and provide you with some tips and safety precautions. Also tonight, we have Seth from SCTV. So um, I just want to thank you so much, Seth, for being here. So we'll get started. Um, with Jason, um, who's going to get us going, and then Sergeant Ford and Officer Morocco can answer any questions that you all might have. But again, if we could just save those for the end of the presentation. Does anybody have any questions before we start real quick? Okay. Take it away, Jason. All right. Um, so I have a, it's, it's a general coyote biology um, presentation that I typically give at <coughs> events like this. The reason why we kind of pulled this together is because we, over the past few years, we've been getting quite a few calls about coyotes in one particular part of Situate, um, kind of generally around the Widow's Walk Golf Course and some of the neighborhoods around there. But I have gotten calls, and I know Kim's gotten calls from all across town, so there's been a lot of concerns about coyote behavior that people are seeing. So I'm going to go through a general coyote biology presentation and then have some stuff in there on some of the conflicts that people typically see, how you can deal with them, some of the laws that are associated with the different solutions for various aspects of um, conflicts with coyotes, and then can answer any questions that you might have at the end relative to your particular situation um, in your neighborhood or what you've seen. Um, for those of you who don't know, I did grow up in this town, uh, lived here right through high school. So I know the town well and, and love it. I live right next door in Marshfield now, but I'm a, I'm a local guy. Um, before I go into coyote biology, just tell you a little bit about our agency. We are the Mass Division of Fisheries and Wildlife. So we're the state agency that's mandated or charged with the stewardship of all of our um, inland natural resources. So conservation, protection, management, of all of our inland fish, wildlife, and their habitats. And we, we do that job for the benefit of the general public so that you can enjoy a healthy environment and enjoy wildlife uh, into future generations. So the species that we have in Massachusetts is known as the Eastern Coyote, Canis latrans, and it's a subspecies of coyote um, that exists in this part of the state. Um, how they got here, it's basically the result of western coyotes uh, interbreeding with gray wolves and domestic dogs as they expanded their range eastward. And I'll get into a little bit about how that happened um, more later on in the talk. You've probably heard a lot of people refer to uh, eastern coyotes as koi wolves or koi dogs. And in reality, scientists generally don't um, recognize those terms. Um, coyotes do have and there's been a number of uh, studies throughout the Northeast, genetic studies. They do have some wolf DNA and dog DNA from very uh, infrequent interbreeding as they expanded eastward. But in reality, they're coyotes, they're functionally coyotes, very similar to um, their western counterparts. 
and uh, there is very little wolf DNA uh, in them. <coughs> because of the, the little bit of wolf DNA and because of some of the prey items that they take advantage of over here, um, they are a little bit larger than western coyotes. They're about the same size as a medium-sized dog. But they're still not very large in the grand scheme of things um, when you're talking about wild animals. Females will average anywhere from 33 to 40 pounds, and males will be about 34 to 47 pounds. And I don't think there's an animal that we deal with in Massachusetts that is overestimated in size more by the general public. Um, can't tell you how many times we get calls that, oh, there's a 75, 150 pound coyote, um, bigger than the German Shepherd. They do look large. They have very thick, long fur coats that makes them look a lot larger. But if you dunk them in a pool and then look at them, they are they are considerably smaller than they look. I've seen one that was 80 pounds. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, we do have very infrequent um, examples of males that weigh up to or over 60 pounds, but that's certainly the exception. And they have a variety of coat colors. The most common coat characteristic that you're going to see on coyotes is a fur from a roadkill animal over here on the table. That's the most common. They're primarily a grizzled brown with black, white, tan. Um, but you can see anything from almost pure blonde to almost completely black and anywhere really in between. But that's, that's the most common over there on the table. Coyotes are typically very shy and elusive creatures, but because they are so adaptable and live in suburban areas, uh, they can quickly become accustomed to human activity, human um, development, and really lose some of that shyness or elusiveness because they're um, so used to it around human habituated areas. They are a crepuscular species, which means, there's two seats up in front, and there's one over here too. Um, crepuscular, which means they're most active dawn and dusk, but it is not unusual for them to be active all day long, all night long. Um, that's just the time period that they tend to be most active and out and about. And they are active year-round, they do not hibernate. <clears throat> Looking at the life cycle over the course of the year, their breeding season is in February and March. Um, so that's when the, the males and females, the uh, alpha male alpha female will pair up and mate. Um, young will be born somewhere between April and May. In Massachusetts, typically we're looking at um, the pups being born in April in a den. Um, and then from that time period on, uh, especially as you get into late May and June through August, the pups will get weaned, they'll get more active, and then they'll start to explore the territory and the adults will be teaching them how to hunt. So they're very visible during the breeding time and during June and August when um, they're teaching the, the pups how to, how to survive on their own. And then in September, somewhere between September and November, some subset of the pups that survive will disperse to go try and find their own territory. Depending on resources available, some of them will stay and be part of the family group or pack. Um, and that's all dependent on how much food is available and whether the, that pack and that territory can sustain um, more individuals. <clears throat> so the pups, you can get anywhere from one to nine, sometimes even 10 or 12 or more pups in a litter. The norm is five or six um, pups, and that's somewhat dependent on the resources available um, to that particular family group. They'll be pretty much wholly dependent on milk for the first 25 to 30 days and then slowly weaned off. At about 35 days, they'll be weaned and no longer dependent on the mother's milk, um, starting to get natural food items um, that the adults will bring back. And then at that same time is when they start to, you know, a little bit before that, they'll start to roam around the, the entrance of the den. But once they're weaned and they get beyond about 35 days, then they'll start to take longer um, exploration from the actual den site and then eventually travel around with the adults or the other members of the family group. And then at six to eight months old, as I mentioned in the last slide, they will um, disperse. Some of them will disperse out to try and find uh, their own territory. And they can disperse you know, hundreds of miles trying to find a, a vacant territory to to establish as their own. 
<clears throat> they use a, a, a variety of different uh, vocalizations. They're all largely just for communication purposes. Um, they'll howl, yip, bark. You've probably all heard it if you're here tonight. You're reasonably interested in coyotes one way or the other. Um, but it's not typically something that, that is something to be concerned about or means they've made a kill. It's primarily for communication. So they'll communicate with other members of their family group. They'll do it to let other coyotes, these transient coyotes that are out, you know, walking the outskirts of defended territories. They'll do it to help defend their territory and let the other coyotes know that that's their home range. During the breeding season, if they're not already paired up, some of these transient coyotes that are looking for a mate will vocalize trying to find um, a mate during the breeding season. And then the pups, especially during the summer when they're getting together and the adults come back, they get excited and they'll, they'll yip and howl. And a lot of times people hear that at night and they think, oh my god, they just killed something out the woods behind my house. But more often than not, it's just them getting excited when one of the family members comes back from being out hunting or traveling. Coyotes are omnivorous and opportunistic, and what that means opportunistic is they're going to take advantage of the most readily available and easy food source. So they'll eat anything from medium, small mammals, so rodents, squirrels, rabbits, um, deer fawns. They do occasionally take adult deer, but it's not a primary um, food source for them. Insects, reptiles, amphibians, carrion or you know, roadkill or dead animals. Hard and soft mass, so fruits, nuts, berries. Um, and then domestic animals, including pets, <laughs> livestock. Anything's on the table, trash, compost, bird seed, pet food, whatever's easiest and they can get a lot of, they're gonna take advantage of it. And that doesn't just go for coyotes, that goes for most any wild animal. They're out there struggling to survive and they're gonna you know, they find an easy food source, they're going to take advantage of it over and over again. People? No, not typically people. Okay. Um, habitats, originally coyotes, you know, the, the western coyotes, they evolved and really made their way in prairies and grassland habitats. Um, but we're finding that they're able to take advantage and they're highly adaptable, can take advantage of any habitat. Um, pretty much agricultural land, forested land, suburbia, and everywhere in between. So they, they find themselves at home pretty much anywhere in Massachusetts uh, across the landscape. And if you look at a typical suburban um, landscape like this, you know, you have forested areas, open agricultural fields or marsh, and then you've got all the suburban development. And what that typically means is food. There's a lot of food around people's homes and developments. So they've got everything they need to survive in these areas and they've, they've been able to thrive. We've also found them right in the most urbanized downtown parts of Boston, making their, their lives um, with just small patches of forest here and there. They're able to find food and find cover in there and, and survive quite well. A little bit on the home range size of coyotes. It's Primarily, and this goes for most species, dependent on food abundance. So if there's a lot of food, they can have a smaller home range because they can get what they need in that smaller area. Less food, they need a larger home range to make, um, make uh, find all the, the resources they need to survive and raise young. So rural areas that tend to have less food resources, they tend to have a larger home range size um, in the vicinity of 20 square miles on average. And then when you get in a suburban landscape, something like uh, around here, the average home range can be closer to five to six square miles or even less. And again, it's really driven by the, the food resources. And then you have these transient individuals, the ones that have been dispersed out from the family group looking for their own territory. And those individuals will range quite far. They can have home ranges that um, can, can be as large as 200 square miles. And they're really just wandering around, bouncing off of other coyote home ranges, trying to find a vacant territory to call their own, or try and find a spot where maybe one of the alpha pair has died for some reason, and they might be able to come in and take over that particular territory. On average, 
coyotes can travel 7 to 16 miles in a day. So a coyote you see this morning, tomorrow it could be on the complete other side of town or in another town, um, depending on you know what part of the state they live in. Again, they're highly adaptable. We found that they're highly adaptable in their what habitats that they can use, what food resources that they take advantage of, and their behavior. They've learned how to live in and around people. And a common misconception out there with a lot of wildlife species is that you know we've cleared this forest, we've cleared that forest, developed this and that, and we're forcing them into our neighborhoods. And when it's just the opposite, that's the case. Our developments are attracting them because there are so many easy food resources. So that's why we have you know, more coyotes and raccoons and foxes and other species in and around our homes. It's because of the easy food that they're finding. So how did coyotes get here to begin with? Prior to European settlement, this is the black on the map is roughly where coyotes existed, the western coyote in the prairies and grasslands of central and western United States. As settlers moved west, they did several things. They cleared forests, they opened up trails, but they also wiped out mountain lions and wolves, two primary predators and limiting factors on coyotes. So then what happened is the western coyotes began to move east, and where they pick up that wolf and dog DNA is as they moved and expanded their range eastward, they very in, in, very occasionally interbred with gray wolves or domestic dogs associated with settlements. Um, and then they basically just expanded eastward all the way to the eastern seaboard. Looking at Massachusetts, the first records we had were in 1959, confirmed records. And then very quickly, you'll see 1980, more records popped up. 1990, they were throughout all of central and western Massachusetts, Cape Cod. And then present day, coyotes are ubiquitous across the landscape uh, of mainland Massachusetts, all the way to the tip of Cape Cod, downtown Boston, all the way to the um, New York border. We're essentially saturated with coyotes in the state. Every t city or town has multiple family groups and transient coyotes, and they're really here to stay. And it, it, the, the message is, if you look at any of the research that's been done on coyotes and, and some of the work that was done out in particularly the West, where they, for a long time, were trying to eliminate coyotes, um, studies have shown that you have to remove over 70% of the population annually to even start to cause a decline, and that is virtually impossible or completely impossible because uh, they really tried everything um, that they possibly could out, out west to knock the coyote numbers down and, and were completely unsuccessful. Uh, as Mass Wildlife is charged with con conserving all of our uh, wildlife and natural resources for the public, we view the coyote as one of uh, another one of our uh, important and valuable ecological species in the state. They serve a valuable role in the uh, ecosystem, um, limiting some of the smaller predators like foxes and um, some rodents, which has an ancillary benefit on other species like songbirds, ground nesting birds, um, and some of the species that they, other species that they prey upon. Intrinsically, many people enjoy seeing coyotes, hearing coyotes on the landscape, um, and use them as a species because, you know, being that they have some similarities to wolves. They are a charismatic species that gets some people interested in studying um, nature and enjoying viewing nature, so they're important in that way. And then recreationally, from wildlife watchers, photographers, as well as hunters and trappers, they enjoy um, coyotes on the landscape. So how do we manage coyotes in the sea? We manage them, again, as an important natural resource, um, but in certain circumstances, we try to work to resolve conflicts where they exist, while at the same time supporting the fact that they're a valuable species uh, on the landscape. We regulate hunting and trapping seasons annually for coyotes uh, and a number of other species. We also regulate problem animal control agents, and a subset, so these are people that can uh, the public can hire to address nuisance or problem um, wildlife issues. You know, if you have a 
squirrel in your attic or bats in your attic or a raccoon under your shed, you can hire this person if you're not capable of uh, dealing with the situation on your own and they can address it for you. For coyotes in particular, we have a special certification that these individuals have to get in order to be able to deal with coyotes because you can't really trap them um, so that they have to work with the town officials to address and this is really for the severe coyote um, problems that, that are out there. And then we do public education, such as talks like this, outreach through our website, mailings and different publications that we do to educate people on coyotes and other suburban wildlife. I'll try and talk very briefly about the population dynamics. Um, <clears throat> So the typical coyote population, you're going to have a, an alpha pair, very similar to the you know, wolves if you've seen documentaries on them, you'll have an alpha pair that's going to defend the territory, whether it's a suburban you know, five or six square mile territory or a more rural 20 square mile territory, they're going to defend it. Depending on the resources available, they will have a family group that consists of offspring from prior years. So they might have some two or three year old offspring that still remain part of the family group and then some of that year's pups. Some of those might stay with the group, some might disperse. And they're highly territorial to, territorial to defend their territory against other coyotes. They'll kill or attempt to kill any foxes that are found in their uh, territory and that's part of the reason why you'll see territorial attacks on uh, larger domestic dogs because they just see them as uh, you know, another dog coming into their territory. In addition to the, the stable family group, you have these transient coyotes that are just you know, kind of out there without a home, roaming the landscape, um, finding the resources they need in between other territories, pairs, or within those, um, within those pairs' territories uh, without being you know, caught or attacked by them. So it's a tough life for those transients, but there are a lot of them out there as well. So looking at a town level, what typically will happen, say you lose a member of the alpha pair, within less than a year, you're either gonna have one of these transients that's been out there looking around for a home range, um, come in and take that individual's place, or you'll have one of the subordinate members of the family group step up and take over. And again, very similar if you, you know, watch any like the Yellowstone Wolf documentaries, it's a very similar dynamic to that. So looking at how their populations react to resources on the landscape, you have abundant resources, you know, it's, it's all common sense stuff, you're going to have a higher coyote density because you'll have more resources out there to allow them to have larger litter sizes, better pup survival rates, a higher number of yearlings that disperse will be able to breed because they're going to be in better condition. And then family size will be larger because they don't need to kick out those pups. They can afford to keep them in the family group because the resources are there. So you'll have more home ranges and smaller home ranges on the landscape. And you can think about this similar to looking at, say, a suburban versus a rural situation. You have scarce resources, just the opposite. You're going to have lower coyote density, lower litter sizes, lower pup survival, less yearlings breeding, and lower family group sizes because more of those pups are going to be forced to disperse. So the primary cause of the mortality with coyotes are vehicle collisions, diseases, and hunting to a lesser degree. And you also have a number of other factors, interactions with other coyotes, um, and just natural uh, injuries and other things like that. Same thing, if you have high mortality, that decreases competition. It's very similar to there being more resources on the landscape. So the same thing, you're going to have higher litter sizes, better survival rates, more yearlings breeding. If you have low mortality, you're going to have lower litter sizes, lower survival or Lower, or higher survival rates and uh, less yearlings breeding. So your survival rate to your pups is going to be lower because there's going to be um, less, um, more competition among the individuals. So to get at, this is probably some of the primary reason that, that we're in situated talking about this and why we go to a lot of towns is either real or perceived conflicts with coyotes. 
So what are people called out? Um, I can't speak for what, what Kim gets calls on, but in general, the, the number one call we get is, I saw a coyote in my yard, and Look it's a problem. Rain. What's that? Oh. OK. All right. OK. Um, so it's just, uh, just seeing a coyote in your yard, that's something that concerns some people. And it can be concerning, but you have to take it into context what the individual's behavior was and what the, con what the circumstances were. But in general, seeing a coyote is not something that people should be concerned about. Property damage. So whether it's due to feeding on pets, livestock, or denning, a lot of times you'll find foxes, less so coyotes will den underneath a, an outbuilding or a shed or a barn and can undermine it or cause, cause damage in some way. We do get quite a few calls about chickens being taken by wildlife and it's, it's not always coyotes, more often it's weasels or fisher or raccoons um, or hawks and owls if you free range. And then human health and pet health safe, uh, safety, pet health and safety is a, another big thing that we get calls about. People concerned about disease transmission, rabies, mange, canine distemper. Typically, you know, your pets are vaccinated or can be treated for any of these things. Um, tax on pets is something we get quite a few calls about, gotten calls about that and documented situations in situ. And then attacks on people, although very rare, we do get um, calls with either concerns about it or actual events happening. So you get mange is a common call we get, whether it's a fox or a, a coyote. And then depredation of pets, and this happens to also be a mangy coyote. It's, you know, you notice um, the tail has no hair on it at all with that individual and he's missing patches. So. Why do most of the conflicts that we get calls about occur? I'd say the vast majority are due to our own behavior. Um, whether it's how we keep our yard, or what we're doing in our yards, or um, how we're feeding our pets, storing our trash, compost, what have you. I'll get into that, but generally, the vast majority of the behavior that we see, or the problematic behavior that we see in coyotes and other wildlife species is tied back to our own behavior. And that's difficult for people to hear, it's difficult um, for a lot of people to change some of the things that they do, but in a lot of cases it's, it's a necessity if you want to see a change in, in the individual animal's behavior. So what do we see that causes the problem? One, and probably the worst possible case when it comes to coyotes, is intentionally feeding them. Because that takes them from an animal that is just indifferent to people to really associating people with a food source and um, <coughs> completely eliminating any and all fear that they might have still had of people uh, when you're intentionally feeding them. Another way that people feed them is through bird feeders. So that's kind of an unintentional situation. A lot of people don't think that a bird feeder is feeding coyotes. They will eat bird seed, they'll come in at night and eat the bird seed that falls on the ground. But even more so than that, they're attracted to the small mammals and rodents that are attracted to your bird feeders. As well as young turkeys, ground nesting birds that will come to your bird feeders. Other unintentional feeding that occurs is improperly protected or stored trash. People put the trash out the night before. <laughs> Um, instead of doing it in the morning, because it's convenient, I know a lot of people do it, but you're also inviting wildlife to come and feed on it at night. It gives them a, a very easy food source. Another thing that they face around suburbia is really <laughs> a lack of harassment. What, what do most people do when they see a coyote in, in the yard? You know, they're up in the yard and they see a coyote. They don't yell at it, they don't run at it, they probably get a little bit nervous and maybe run away or walk away from it and really give leeway to that animal. When in reality we should be harassing them if we don't want them in our yards. And every time that happens that just furthers their, their behavior down the path where they have no fear of people. Attacks on people are extremely, extremely rare but they have happened. 
We have had um, seven confirmed attacks on people since the 1950s. So since coyotes got here, um, two of those were confirmed rabid, three were highly suspected as rabid based on the animal's behavior, and two of the animals were highly habituated coyotes, so they were very used to people, and they suspected one of them had been, um, they documented that it had been in people's care, so it might have been at a wildlife rehabilitator, um, it had a mended leg and it was released, and that was an attack and sandwich on a small child. Outside. Uh, put this into perspective, across the U.S. each year there's four, four and a half million dog bites. So when you're thinking about the things that you, your children, your pets are most at risk of, it's not coyotes. Um, but I'm not saying you shouldn't be concerned and, and uh, pay attention to your surroundings when you're out, outside. Rabies is extremely rare in coyotes. Um, they are not a major rabies vector. Um, since 1992, there's only been 13 coyotes that tested positive, and that's a very, very infin infinitesimal number of um, all the species that test positive for rabies. It is problematic when they do catch rabies because they are a larger animal and they can become aggressive, but it is, again, extremely rare. Put that into perspective, there's been 21 cows that have tested positive for rabies, and how many people you know, think of or associate a cow with having rabies. <clears throat> Habituation is probably the primary thing that we get concerned about, and this occurs in suburbia everywhere in Massachusetts, where there's a lack of threat, so people aren't harassing them. They're acclimated to people, they get very used to the people's presence, and indifferent to it. So, you know, they don't see people as a threat, so they're not going to run away when they see you. They might walk along, they might sit down or lay down. It's not unusual behavior for them now in suburbia. They're also finding so much easy food in and around our homes that it makes a lot of sense for them to, to spend their time in and around our, our suburban developments. Some of the food sources that they're finding, bird feeders, I already mentioned how they get food from that. Garbage and compost, um, they easily get into garbage cans. A lot of people compost. And we saw it, I was investigating a potential animal bite the other day in Hingham, and there's an com unprotected compost pile right in the area um, with eggs and meat scraps and things like that. So you know, anything like that, you're thinking of a wild animal that's looking out to try and survive and find food. So if it finds easy food, it's going to take advantage of it. And then, you know, it's sad to put up, but Outdoor pets, whether it's cats that are let outside or unattended medium or small dogs that are outside, we can't expect a coyote to see that any different than a fox or a rabbit or a squirrel. It's an animal in their environment that's smaller than them and it looks like something they should eat. So if we let cats outside, we have to realize that Coyotes and a number of other things see them as prey and they might not come home. Pet food, if you feed your pets outside and your pet doesn't consume every bit of that food, that also becomes unattractive to wildlife. Um, gardens, fruit trees, you know, they will, they will attract any species. Coyotes will come to apple trees, things like that, but I don't typically associate that with a, a major human produced food source for coyotes, it's going to really draw them in. Um, to look at some of the patterns of behavior that we typically hear about or get concerned about. So frequent use of residential areas, completely normal. Frequent daytime activity, we get calls about it all the time. It's 11 a.m. and I saw a coyote, something's wrong with it. No, it's completely normal, especially now when they're out trying to get more food because they're raising pups and they got to bring food back to, to feed them. A nighttime attack on an unsupervised pet. So you let a little 20 pound dog out in the backyard, it's dark out, just open the door, let it out, it gets attacked by a coyote. This says somewhat bold. I don't consider that somewhat bold. I consider that normal because the coyotes are out there, it's, they're in their environment. Um, they're in their environment, so that's um, 
That's something normal. It's a prey item for them. If you're in the yard, that's somewhat bold. Daytime attack on an unsupervised pet. I would put that as a somewhat bold category, but that's still, you know, unsupervised animals are part of the ecosystem at that point, and they can be preyed on by anything. Attack on a leashed pet, or if you're there and your dog's 15 feet from you, 20 feet from you, and coyote attacks, that's, that's getting bold. That's getting something to be concerned about. If it's on a leash, that's very bold. And then when they approach or closely follow a person, not with a dog, if you have a, a small dog on a leash and you're walking, that coyote's not really looking at you. If it's trotting along, stopping, kind of, we get a lot of calls, it was following me. <coughs> it's just keyed in on that dog. So they're gonna follow that dog. Um, that's still kind of bold if you're right there, but it's, it's not um, something to be very concerned about. If they're following you and you're alone, you know, out for a walk, out for a jog, and they're following you and they don't respond to harassment, you yell at it, you chase it, you haze it, and it doesn't move off, that's, that's getting concerning. And then actually acting aggressive, growling, or actually physically engaging with a person, that gets to the point of being you know, an extreme behavior. So the top four, those don't constitute a, a public safety hazard. The bottom few, that's when we get concerned and we have to take further steps to deal with the situation. So how to resolve conflicts? Number one is modifying our behavior. So we need to remove, if we have issues with coyotes, if they're, you know, you're concerned about them in your yard, each and every one of us has to look in our yard and see what we can do to, to be a part of the solution. Whether it's taking down bird feeders, I know a lot of people love to feed the birds. If you must, get the bird feeders with huge trays underneath that limit the amount of seed that gets on the ground as, as much as possible. And then every time you see a coyote, act bold towards it, yell, make loud noises, carry an air horn, um, do anything you can to harass it to establish some fear in that individual animal. So take down bird feeders or use the ones that's, that keep seed off the ground. Secure your garbage. Don't put it out the night before. Um, if you have a problem with wildlife getting into your trash, then figure out a way to secure the lid on so they can't get it. Store it in a shed or a garage or an outbuilding, something along those lines. And then there's readily available wildlife proof compost containers now. So if you do compost, invest in something or build something that's gonna keep wildlife from using it as a food source. Ways we recommend people harass coyotes and other potentially um, bold suburban animals, air horns, whistles, um, nobody's going to really carry around a pot and pan, but if you're in your yard and you see a coyote in the backyard and you want to run out on the back deck and that's all you have available, it's better than nothing. Also say you can throw objects, tennis balls, water balloons. Um, I tell people if you, know, if you or you have kids that are into paintball and you have a paintball gun handy, you know, that helps because it actually, if you, if you can hit them, if you've ever been hit with a paintball, it, it, it does hurt a little bit. So it, it'll do uh, take a little bit step further to harass that animal and instill some fear in it. Spraying with a hose or water gun, if, if, if available, a hose is more practical if you're outside. And then don't back down. So with coyotes, other species, look big, look large, make eye contact. Don't turn around and run away or turn your back. If you want to move away, slowly keep your eyes on them, make a lot of noise. Some of the same stuff that people tell you when you're, you know, encounter a black bear. Just look big, open up your coat, um, and make a lot of noise. You can run at the animal if you have a stick or a rake. Um, with turkeys, we get calls about problem turkeys. If you have an umbrella, and you can kind of pop the umbrella because it makes a big opening. That's something that you can use to scare coyotes and other animals. Just a bunch of different things you can do to try and reinstill some of the fear that they've lost just because there's there's no reason for them to fear people in and around suburbia. This is important, especially in situations um, where we've identified either someone intentionally feeding coyotes or you know around parks and playgrounds where somebody or a golf course where somebody might 
say, hey, there's a cute coyote, watch this, and throw a granola bar over to it, or you know, a piece of beef jerky over to it, and think it's cute because they're on a golf course or they're in a park where they don't live, and they do it. Talk to your kids, especially younger kids, about knowing the difference between a coyote and a dog, and then also tell them to never approach a dog or an animal that they don't know. They see a dog, whether it's a coyote or a dog that they don't know, they shouldn't approach it. If you keep instilling that in them, because we don't want them to walk up to a coyote, especially if it's one that's been intentionally fed by people. We've had foxes um, in several circumstances where people were feeding the foxes, and then you, you have a kid, you know, just walk along with an ice cream cone or a sandwich in his hand, and the fox comes up and grabs it right out of his hand or her hand. So, um, really teach your kids how to be smart around wildlife and any animal that they don't know. Tell them to make themselves look bigger if they ever do get scared. Open up their coats, make a loud noise, back away, don't run, and find an adult to, to help them harass the animal or, or get them safe. For your yards, there's, there's not a lot you can do other than eliminating food resources, but you can make it less attractive um, and more safe. If you've got a brushy backyard, and you want to cut back some of that thick brush so it's more open to view, that can help, especially at night, because uh, if you have your pets out in the yard and they get close to the edge, you can have coyotes or other animals that are just inside that brushy tree line. Removing rock piles or large piles of brush, those can serve as den sites. Um, so if you have those on your yard or your property, uh, you, can, you can eliminate those so you can eliminate potential denning locations on your property. A lot of people ask about fences. We recommend at least six feet high for a fence. Coyotes can climb um, over chain link if they really want to. I mean, if I was putting a fence up, and I'd probably feel fine putting a four foot fence up because they really need to want to get into your backyard very bad if they're gonna go over a chain link fence. But if you wanna really be sure, you wanna let a small dog out at night unattended, six foot fence and they even make these things that are shown up in the upper right, they're called roll bar fences. You can do it yourself or you can get, get them installed. Then when something gets up to the top, similar to some of the things that they have for squirrels and bird feeders, it'll roll so they can't get a grip on that top and it helps something from climbing over the fence. We recommend proper containment of livestock and pets. So livestock, you can use electric fencing. Free ranging if you have chickens, I know it's great, but um, they're very similar to your pets. When you let them free range, they become part of the uh, food chain and they are certainly not the top of the food chain. So if you're okay with a few of your chickens disappearing or all of them, you can free range. But if you don't want to lose them, then you should consider a, an enclosed coop and run. We recommend keeping house cats indoors. Um, only, not only for their safety, but there's been a number of studies that show how damaging outdoor cats are to native wildlife, migratory songbirds in particular, and some small mammals. Um, and then keeping dogs leashed and closely supervised. A leash, obviously I shouldn't have to tell people this, but it does nothing to protect your dog if you're not holding the other end of it. And then in general, we, we try and teach people to live with wildlife. Um, you know, we should enjoy that we have wildlife in our suburban environments to, to view and um, listen to and, and take solace in the fact that they're there. Um, so for the most part, we want people to tolerate the animals living there because they're not going away. You remove one individual, another one's going to be right there. We know what we know about coyote biology. They're, they're going to move right back in. So we're better off learning to tolerate the animals modify our behavior so we don't get into conflicts with them and we'll all be better off. In some extreme instances we have had to get into a situation where an individual animal is removed. Um, it's not necessary, it's, it's only necessary when there's a direct threat to human health and safety. So that can be determined by um, your law enforcement personnel, the environmental police, uh, as well as in consultation with, with mass wildlife. When property is damaged, so if they're killing livestock uh, is another situation. 
And it's only when that responsible individual or individuals can be identified. It's not going to, people aren't going to just go in and remove coyotes at will because there was a little bit of concern. Um, there are some legal issues relocating animals. We always get questions, you know, can you come trap the, the fox or come trap the raccoon and then move it somewhere else? Bring it down to the Miles Standish State Forest. It'll be great there. Um, moving wildlife is prohibited by law, and there's a number of reasons for that. One is spreading disease um, and concerns around that. Another one is when you tip, typically take an animal, whether it's a coyote or a fox, what have you, that's territorial, you pick it up out of its territory and then you plunk it down in another individual's territory, there's a high, high likelihood it's going to be killed, it's going to be highly stressed, um, and it's not going to be a good situation for that animal. So that's why we try, you know, lethal removal is always a last resort, but it is something that uh, in certain circumstances we have to consider. There are a number of trapping restrictions. Um, Again, you can't relocate, so if trapped animals need to be euthanized or released on the same property. So the reason why you have the released on the same property is, say you have a woodchuck denning under your, you know, going underneath your shed. You can trap it, close off the shed with fencing that's buried, and then release the woodchuck right on your same property. It'll go somewhere else. Um, that's, that's the reason for that law. Box traps are the only things that we can use for coyotes in Massachusetts without a special permit and done um, <coughs> by pretty much a research or a biologist. Back in 96, there was a law that, that prohibited a number of different trap types. The two most common and effective traps for coyotes were padded, like, uh, padded foothold traps and snares, and those were both prohibited back in 1996 by a public referendum. And then we have hunting um, discharge, hunting and firearms discharge regulations that come into effect 150 feet from a road, uh, from a road um, 500 feet from occupied dwellings unless you're given permission. And sometimes you have town bylaws or ordinances. I know in Situate there's a, a bylaw that prohibits discharge of firearms east of 3A. Uh, but just looking, and I'll show a map in a minute, um, just looking at Situate, Firearms discharge is, is extremely limited anyways. So when we get to a situation when you're going to lethally remove an animal, who can do it? It's really your local law enforcement officers, animal control officers if they have police powers, and full police powers or have been deputized. Massachusetts environmental police officers, our <coughs> certified problem animal control agents can do it in certain circumstances working with the municipal officials. And then some towns have their own municipal problem animal control agents. And then during the regulated hunting season, I'm not even going to mention trapping because there's virtually you know, no trapping of coyotes in Massachusetts because they don't go in cage traps. During the hunting season, licensed hunters can uh, legally remove individuals. But for those bottom three, all of the discharge, um, firearms discharge restrictions do apply. So here's the town of Situate. The pink is everything that's within 500 feet or 150, 500 feet of houses or 150 feet of roads. So as you can see, I would have to guess 90, 95% of the town, just per the state law, discharge setbacks is closed um, to regulated hunting or discharge of firearms. There is a separate law Mass General Law, Chapter 131, Section 37, that states that a property owner, immediate family member living on the property, or a permanent full-time employee can kill wildlife while they are in the act of causing damage. So an example of that would be you have a fisher that's in your chicken coop, killing your chickens, and you are 500. You have a property where you're 500 feet away from all of your neighbors you could go out and shoot the fisher while it's killing your chickens. You have to report that to us in the environmental police, but that law does allow you to protect yourself and your property from damage. You can't do it preemptively, like you couldn't just go out and see a fisher in your backyard, you have a chicken coop and, and shoot the fisher, it has to be in the act of causing damage. <coughs> can't use poison or any prohibited traps, and again, follow the discharge laws. The biggest take-home message with 
addressing concerns or problems with coyotes or any wildlife in, in particular is modifying our own behavior and addressing human associated food sources in our yards. Talk to your neighbors if you're having a problem. You know, probably dealt with 10 calls on turkeys this year. People calling, there's 50 turkeys in my yard, they're going to the bathroom everywhere, they're pecking my car. <laughs> Nine times out of 10 we go and within like five houses, we find somebody who's throwing cracked corn or peanuts or whatever it might be out on the ground and attracting 50 turkeys to the neighborhood and they're causing a problem for everybody in the neighborhood. We talk to the people, generally, they realize that it's a problem and they stop, but sometimes they don't, and there's no law against feeding wildlife. That's, that's the issue. So people can say, I don't care, I'm still going to do it. Even if you have somebody feeding coyotes, feeding coyotes rotisserie chicken in the backyard, and it's causing a problem, unless you can get something through your town where you pass a bylaw or ordinance that prohibits feeding wildlife or feeding certain species of wildlife, or you find some way through your Board of Health or your local health regulations or your public safety regulations where that person is creating a human health and safety hazard, you can't really do anything about it. It doesn't necessarily mean that that individual couldn't be subject to civil lawsuits between neighbors or something along those lines, but in terms of laws and regulations on the book, there's not really much you can do. So then, coupling, modifying our behavior, eliminating the food sources, <laughs> harassing the animals when you see them. And like I mentioned several times, this goes for any wildlife species that you're having a problem with. If you do away with the food that's attracting them and then make them uncomfortable every time you see them in their yard, eventually, you know, they're smart. Coyotes in particular, they're smart. They're as smart as your dog. They're going to learn and get trained pretty quickly that, you know, when I go to Betty's yard, it's no bird seed anymore and she yells at me and throws tennis balls at me. Maybe I'm going to avoid that yard from now on. You know, it's, it's common sense, but it is difficult for people to change their behavior. I understand that. And we rely on, you know, everybody in the community to do their part to try and solve problems when they exist. But we are here and the environmental police are here and your local law enforcement are here for when a situation gets so bad that something needs to be done to protect human health and safety, to remove certain individuals, that is an option. So. With that, I can turn it over to the environmental police or back to Kim or take any questions if you want now or you want to wait till the end, Kim? Does anyone have any questions? Uh, we can, everybody in the room can <laughs> AJ and me and Jason. Yeah. Is it questions now? Oh, sure. but, but you guys, we, I, we, we know everyone has their own little problem, and we, we're here about your little problem. I'm not trying to be mean or anything, but we'll be here till tomorrow. <laughs> so we understand everyone has their little, you know, whatever street that is. So in generalities, can we just kind of, you know... AJ's a Bruins fan. Get it together. <laughs> no, I'm just saying, you know, I have this, you know, I'm not even mean, though. But my little problem is they all live in my yard. All perfect. <laughs> so, um, question. You showed the map where they're expanding exponentially, right? And if everybody takes accountability to do the things that we need to do, aren't we going to end up in a few years running around with air horns and water balloons just chasing an angry mob of coyotes into someone else's yard? I mean, they're expanding, the woods get reduced, where, what's the bigger picture solution? Because they don't have anywhere else to go. So they're not expanding. Coyotes are self-regulating, so they're not expanding. So if, if everybody, you know, say situate bands, bird feeding, or whatever, feeding wildlife, everybody stops feeding wildlife and the amount of food goes down. The amount of coyotes are going to go down slightly and their home ranges are going to get a little bit bigger because they need to have a bigger area to, to find food. But they're not, you know, we're saturated with the population is pretty stable right now. It's not going to grow up or, or down. The only way if you get like distemper comes through and knocks them down, they might grow quick for a few years and go above carrying capacity, but then they'll come back down and normalize. Yeah, but individual animals can be trained, but sometimes, you know, those individuals get too far down the road where 
say they've been fed directly or you know what have you and they've gotten to the point where they're overly bold then that's a situation where maybe you know somebody hires a problem animal control agent or you know a law enforcement official comes in and says you know that's the one somebody can point out that's the one that came after me and that's the one that's always bold and they remove that individual animal yeah, the, the populations of coyotes are going to um, rise and fall dependent upon the like, food source. Mm -hmm. So that we probably already have like the number of carrying capacity in Massachusetts. I'll sit with that, I'm sure. Yeah. Okay. I, I think the problem is not one like the problem is, is a human species. Where they're not educated no. about wildlife and how to be around them. So they want to poison them, they want to I mean they're ones that think are toxic, especially very toxic to the environment. I think trying to hurt the animal is not a good thing either. I think we need to just learn to you know, live with the animals and deal with it. The other thing that we hear before we um, now I'd also like to address the fact that people poison mice. Mice is one of their food sources. We poison mice, it goes it's a it's a chain. It, owls catch mice that are poisoned and they die. So people have to think twice about using poison. You should never use poison. Yeah, there's quite a bit of research right now and information out there about using rodenticides and the impacts that it has on, you know, because when I was growing up, I never saw rat traps. You never saw them. Now I see them everywhere. And we're seeing more and more hawks and owls, you know, things that prey on rodents that are showing up in, you know, sick or injured at wildlife rehabilitation centers because of Rodenticide, so, yeah. So, um, we had four or five 20 feet from our deck, which I know now is probably a family, mm -hmm. and it was 11 o'clock in the morning, so that's not out of the realm, which I thought was a little late. But I wouldn't go outside for two weeks. My husband was walking me to the car in the morning, and I would call when I got in the driveway. And and, and it, that's, that's very hard to live with, feeling like you can't go outside. Um, even our medium-sized dog, she wouldn't go to the bathroom. Mm -hmm. So I, that's, to me, it's a problem. For me, it's not going outside. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would say that you're, you're okay with the coyotes being there, and if you can, you know, doing some of the things to, to harass them. It's, I know it's tough, and people are scared of, of coyotes, and I don't blame anybody for being scared when they're. You know, they're the largest predator we have in this part of the state because we don't have bears. But harassing them a little bit and, you know, maybe you don't have anything attracting them to, to your yard in particular. Um, but maybe some of your neighbors do. But harassing them a little bit and hopefully that will reinstill the fear. I mean, we're going to see coyotes. I, you know, say one of the officers came over tomorrow and dispatched all five of them. Less than a year, you're going to have five more tickets placed. So it's it's something we have to live with. And um, absent reported like real aggressive bold behavior, it's it's not um, not a health and safety hazard. So when you say harass them and can throw something at them like a tennis ball, they won't turn to you. No, I've never heard of any. You know, they should be scared. They're not harassed by people. So if you throw something at them yell at them, you know, loud noises, anything like that will, should scare them off. If it doesn't, then that's something to call us or the police about because that's unusual behavior. Back corner a little bit. Uh, you had some excellent tips for, for coyote in the yard. What about fox? Are they the same tips? Same, same exact thing. Now, if I have fox and coyote, that means the coyote aren't eating the fox necessarily, they're cohabitating? Uh, it probably means that you have a, you know, a wily fox that's <laughs> avoided, <laughs> avoided getting killed by the coyote, yeah. Lucky you. Yeah. All right, so I have concerns because we've been in our house for about four years and our land abuts uh, conservation land, which abuts the golf course. Mm -hmm. And over that four-year window, we are starting to see an increase of coyotes come through the woods. 
Now, I know I'm not, I'm not supposed to be talking about me personally, so I'm sorry. But, um, we have a very large dog. She's about 82 pounds, and uh, twice she's been charged. One was at night, and one was during the day. So the nighttime piece, uh, we were out yelling at this coyote to do all the things that you talked about. But the coyote was pretty brazen and really didn't move much. So over time, we've started to see that there's an increase in the number of coyotes coming out of that area of the woods. And I know that you had said at one point some kind of a study was done on the golf course to determine if there were more than usual being bred and born. Um, so I mean, is that something that is done routinely to kind of see what the numbers of coyotes are in the area, or is that just how is that, you know, determined? No, we don't, I mean, we have a, a loose estimate of the number in the state. On um, the town level, we don't, you know, I could look at Situate, I didn't do it for tonight, but I could look at Situate and probably take like a conservative, do like a four square mile territory, an average family group size, and estimate the population. Um, the number that you're seeing around the golf course, those guys have been there for a lot of years, and their population, I didn't, we didn't study the population there. We went and looked and saw that, you know, they were concentrated in one particular area and we suspected that there was some inadvertent feeding going on. Um, maybe, and I've been talking to the town for years and maybe even going back like five or six, seven years, that there was always suspected kind of feeding sites at certain locations around the golf course. Um, but I don't think the population, the population is right in line with what the habitat can support right now. Um, it's probably just a manner of, you know, they might be using the, using their home range a little bit differently or they're, where they're going to get food brings them through your particular part of the, the area more frequently. If, you know, say there's a whole bunch of bird feeders or somebody feeding something, they're going to use a predictable route to go to it. And I know that some of the people I had talked to, talked to in one individual specific neighborhood had an issue, you know, every day, four or five coyotes coming right through on a predictable pattern. So we tried to address it the best we could. That's We're also working with Widow's Walk because what we found there is that the pups are being born right out on the core space. I don't know where mm -hmm. I went out there to the ride with uh, Ryan Cahill. I couldn't believe it. They were right, they were right there. And people, we're walking up to them and feeding them. Oh, <laughs> so that's something that I've, I've talked I talk to Ryan every season. You know, don't forget, we're gonna I had hoped some of them were gonna come here tonight from the golf course, because that's really important. Talk about, you know, now they're getting used to people. So that might be some of what you're seeing. Um, and so we are working diligently on trying to change people's behavior. Yeah, I would recommend too, if you're gonna put your dog out at night, you may want to. Oh, well, we go up. Yeah, but, you may want to walk it on the leash. Yeah, because they're going to look at your dog at night, uh, eating on dog in the chair. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you mentioned it. I apologize. What, how long do they live? Uh, it it depends in the wild. I mean, they they can live five, six, seven years. I think on average, an adult will go four to five. I've never seen one for all of them that we have in our neighborhood. We have a lot of acres of woods, and there's a lot of them. I've never seen one dead. Where are, where are they going down? Highways, yeah. <laughs> you know, if they get mange real bad, they're just going to grow up somewhere in the woods. And are we at risk? So we have a lot of woods we go down and we dump leaves and grass and stuff. Is there a risk of getting close to the den? I don't know. I don't know where they come from. There's a whole neighborhood. Supermarkets and everything. Elm Street. Elm Street? Um, yeah. yeah. The woods in the back by you know, the Evangeline. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah, I mean, getting close to a den. If a person gets close to a den, the, the if the pups are up and about, they're going to go down on the ground, and the adults are going to move off. <laughs> <laughs> um, dogs, you know, if a dog gets close to a den and the adults are there, they will they will attack the dog to protect the pups for sure. So what do you know? A lot of times, I go out to. If somebody complains about coyotes, either I or one of my biologists goes out. That's the first thing I do is you know, walk around the yard and tell them to become the bird feeders or whatever. And then I go in the woods and walk all through the piece of woods and try and see if there's a den site close yeah. by. And if you identify it, there's things you can do. So if you find a den site, 
Um, and this goes for something denning underneath your shed or you know coyote den in the woods right behind your house. You can, if you can run an extension cord out there and play a radio with like talk radio is best. <laughs> put a couple tennis balls, put a couple tennis balls or rags soaked in ammonia and refresh them every couple of days. That's enough because pups will, uh, coyotes will change dens, foxes will change dens periodically throughout the season anyways. A little bit of disturbance they're going to pick up and they're going to move to another den site. And hopefully it's one that's further away from people. The buff balls are good too. Oh, yeah, buff balls are good. What's the well, if you want to, you want to get them out of there. Yeah. I have a question for you. I walk my dogs early in the morning. I see coyotes usually um, by themselves. Um, one time, my dog wanted to play with the coyote, but the coyote was fearful, so kind of um, went away. The uh, I'd say about a month ago, I ran into a pack of three on Hazel Avenue. This was about 6 a.m. Is it different um, when you're faced with a little pack? This pack ended up moving towards. Um, the condos, what is it called, Rachel's, uh, mm -hmm. Rachel's Way, but they did not approach, but are you more at risk if you run into a group of three, they, like pack mentality? Because I think no, this one can you'd be, I mean, your pet, if it was off leash, would be more at risk just okay. because numbers game. By the person, you know, there's, there's no, they're not going to respond any different. That's just the family group, okay. or a portion of the family group. Moving. I just was concerned that yeah. they might be in more likely to be in attack, not attack, but they were not at all. They went away, but I just was wondering if they were more likely to hunt. <laughs> yeah, I, coyotes, unlike wolves, they don't hunt as a pack. They okay. hunt individually. Okay. So that's just, when you see a few of them together, they're basically just, you know, okay. part of the family group moving through their territory. Okay. One of the things that I, a takeaway I, I have from and all the work I've done with coyotes over the years is that I would be much more concerned about a domestic dog than I would about a coyote. I mean, I do, what, 30, 40 dog bites a year, and coyote bites zero. I have had a couple fox bites. Those foxes have ended up testing positive. But I have to tell you, it's just rare that a, a, a person would get bitten by a coyote. We've had a couple interactions with dogs, but it's been mostly at night when the dog is outside by him or herself, and it's usually been a smaller dog. So I think the dog bite information that he presented earlier with 4.7 million like that, I think, yeah. around, the, around the country a year is like right on par with what, I'm, what I deal with. So again, I'd be more concerned about that 80 pound lab that doesn't know you or, or you know, another type of Um, I was I was raised to appreciate wildlife, and I think that there's something in me that that rejects the idea of throwing objects at wildlife. Um, I feel like I'm harassing them, but I do I don't have any problem making noise. And my my son goes out the house regularly by himself, and he one day last season um, encountered a coyote face to face, and the, the coyote was completely indifferent to him and walked the other way. Um, but after that, I thought, well, you know, I better, I better do some research and make sure that he's not at risk. So I looked up on the SPCA website, and they said, you know, to make as much noise as possible to, so, to make sure that the coyote doesn't habituate to humans. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, okay, what can I get him that's going to make a lot of noise? So I looked up on Amazon, and they sell 10 packs of party noisemakers that are excruciatingly loud <laughs> that don't involve anything but a little plastic canister that's on a leash that you hang around your neck and it has a little latex um, piece at the end and an air hole and you blow through that thing and I'm telling you you don't want to be anywhere near it it is so loud and it's not toxic to anything and it, it costs 10 bucks for a 10 pack so I, when he goes out walking he hangs one around his neck and nobody worries about anything because you got a chance to use it um, he hasn't used it yet, but I'm not going to send him out without one. <laughs> that's um, but you know, that's that's just an, I think that's an easy solution yeah. because it's so loud, and I can't imagine any animal, you know, whether it's a coyote or anything else, that's going to be any want to be anywhere near that. Yeah, that's a great that's idea. Great. What about the decibels that that sends out? Great other clearing out the future. Has anybody studied the decibels on some of these things? No, I'm not sure. Yeah. Yes. With all the 
construction and demolishing the forest and all that <coughs> constituent that I've been following. Um, if somebody willingly destroys a coyote den, is that against the law? Yes. If you, I know it if you, happens. If you kill, us, you know, if you destroy the den when there's yes. not animals there, there's nothing against the law on that, unless unless you're not on your own property and you're doing yeah. something on somebody else's property. But if if there's animals there and you kill them or harm them, then yes, that's illegal. I happen to know the neighborhood where that happened last summer, and the little pups were just wandering around aimlessly. There's now two new houses there. Mm -hmm. And I, I have been living out here. Yeah, so that's something that we would want to know. About. I would have stopped it, but I was in New York okay. for nine months. Right. Big mistake. But I was told when I got back from yeah. people in that neighborhood, it was very sad. Yeah. Well, that's something we would want to know about. Well, I was the town neighborhood person that would report things. I left for <laughs> Not everybody does it. I understand. How do you identify Yeah. Well, I mean, you'll see, they can dent in a number of different locations, so you, a lot of times you'll see, you know, they'll be on a bank, and it, it, it can be a hole this big, you'll see a lot of typically dirt, fresh dirt and sand pulled out around the entrance, you might see bones, or you'll definitely see scat, um, animal parts, but it, it'll be, if you've ever seen a woodchuck burrow or den, it'll be like that, just probably twice the size, underneath a blown down tree, and underneath a rock pile or a large brush pile in the edge of a steep slope kind of down near the edge near a wetland, anywhere like that. Underneath a shed is a little bit tougher if they can get under. If, coyote, if there's a hole big enough for a coyote to get under, sometimes they'll den and it won't, it'll just be kind of like a nest in the leaves that accumulate under a shed. Okay, so anybody else with questions? Okay, we'll take a couple more. Just, just go into yeah. this, yeah. Yeah. Any interactions between coyotes and fishers? Uh, they probably generally, you know, avoid each other. Um, a coyote could take a fisher, theoretically, but I doubt that it's, you know, they're probably just mutual avoidance. Fishers are, you know, great climbers, so if they ever encounter a coyote, they just walk through. Yes. So I just want to say thank you to everyone for showing up tonight. This presentation going to be able to be shared by, so it'll be really helpful if you guys can all share it with your neighbors and all your friends and all your community people. Because the more they're educated, the better it's going to be. The state has a whole bunch of the handouts up here if you didn't see them before, and I think it includes AJ's phone number too. Yes, is there any movement underfoot in the town to um, some of the measures you talked about, uh, not able to those people feeding them and that kind of thing? Are there any, is there any movement underfoot that would make it illegal? For yeah. Because well, I'm up in the Cedar Crest area. Right well, that's where we course. had some mm -hmm. individuals. We tried to discourage it. Say, oh, what's your oh, level? No, I understand that. But I'm, is there any movement? I don't know if anyone knows the answer to this question. Well, it's, it's not illegal. It's real, no, it's not illegal. No. I mean, the thing is, we have coyote. I have coyote daily in the yard. We have a small dog. Since I, I've lived in the house for 25, 30 years, I can't use the yard. I can't let the dog used to throw a ball for the dog in the yard. I can't do that anymore. Dog's always on a leash. It's recently, it was last night. You know, we've got a coyote at the end of the dog. They don't even get out of the way when you you know, probably partly because of the feeding. Um, I'm sorry, what neighborhood are you looking at? Okay. We we've, we've been up there, all of us have been up there, um, speaking with someone in that area. So in between that and the turkeys, I call yeah. them. Yeah. Yeah. People are not trying not to find any turkeys, but I should say like twenty-five no, turkeys or something. New York. Because of birds. Right. And I'm up every morning at like five in the morning because I need somebody feeding the birds, you know? Yeah. So maybe that's something for the new board of health director. <laughs> and he's <you> first week. <laughs> there are there are a couple of communities in Massachusetts yeah. that have passed so, feeding bylaws. So if you have um, if someone has excessive bird feeders on their property and coyotes are attracted to that, 
we can go out and cite the owner of the property as a nuisance complaint. It's very difficult to have them take down. If they have 10 or 15 bird feeders, it's easy to say you can't have 10 or 15. You can have one or two, but you can't go more than that because then it becomes excessive. But it's a very slippery slope as far as what you can do and what you can't do. So that's what you see. There you go. Um, yeah, go ahead. Uh, Will the coyote go to a mulch pile that just has potato peelings and coffee grounds? I would never put meat bark in a mulch pile. Potato peels, possibly, but I wouldn't would see that as a huge attraction. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of a little bit of a little bit of a little Vegetable, but they eat vegetables, so any vegetable matter in there, if it's edible and easy, they'll go for it. So yes. Can I ask a question? I mean, we sure. just got here. Yes. The one question I was going to ask, the uh, we live on Bullrush Farm right off of Hollett. Okay. And one morning really early, I was getting up about 5.30, going out, mm -hmm. and this thing took off. It was from down the end of the street, and there were a lot of wild turkey preserves down the end of the street. I thought it was a mountain lion. <laughs> and I just want it was huge, and I just wondered if you've seen anything like that, or heard stories. I've heard we, stories. We get we get reports from time to time throughout Massachusetts. There's only been, I think, two confirmed mountain lions. Or bobcat? Is that similar? Bobcat is certainly a possibility. We yeah. do have confirmed bobcats even on the Cape now. Yeah. Um, mountain lions. We had the one that. It's just a real strange dispersal case came from South Dakota and it got documented all the way, came through Massachusetts, ended up getting road killed in Connecticut. And then back in I think the 80s, late 80s, there was confirmed Bob, uh, mountain lion scat and a cached beaver kill. If you, they kill something, they drag it somewhere, eat something, then cover it over and save it for later. Um, but there was no confirmation whether that was a wild cat or one that got escaped, you know, because some people have mountain lions and tigers and things like that as illegal pets. Um, but we haven't had any confirmed. But bobcats lions. are more. Bobcats are certainly a possibility. Another thing that's a possibility is a mangy coyote, because when they lose a lot of their hair, they're still a big animal. They're kind of just all that tan color. And they don't have, they still have a long tail, but they might not have a ton of hair on it. So. Actually, that could have been it, because it, it was kind of blondy. But not the hair on it, the kind of bald, but yeah. it was big, yeah. long tail. Their ears will get a little disfigured from the mange, too, so that's a possibility, but it could have been bobcat, too. Okay. Thank you. So, when will this be on TV? <clears throat> uh, well, we have uh, three stations, 8, 9, and 22, but the best way is Sichuan Community Television on YouTube. We'll have it on there, so make sure you check that out. They'll like the page. We'll we, it'll be up there within 24 hours. Okay. So, I think we're going to wrap, wrap it up. Um, my last kind of words are rabies shots for your pets. Very, 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 very important. There's definitely rabies in situate. There has been for as long as I've been here and, and beyond. It's a real, it's a real disease. It's really here. We don't test every animal that we may have to put down for being suspected of having rabies unless it bites a person or a pet. So we've had a number of those this season. Very unusual year here in situate from January to now. Uh, the calls that we're getting are just Numerous three, four calls in a week for animals that are not acting quite right. So it's really important that everybody keeps their animals up to date, um, keeps your dogs on a leash, and it's already been mentioned, but your cats as best you can keep them inside and, sh and share that information with your friends and neighbors. Um, yes. Another one. Yes. Did you um, talk about ticks at all from either deer or anything else? We didn't, only because um, the health department put on a presentation a couple of weeks ago strictly on uh, ticks and tick and all that, so we didn't really touch on that tonight. But that's another thing that's obviously yeah. very tick yeah. for your pets. Very, very Where important. would I find it? Such a great television. Okay. okay. Check it out. A lot of views. Yeah. Um, so, in the back of the room, there's tons of handouts uh, from the Mass Department of Fisheries and Wildlife. We thank them very much for being here. Jason, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.